These are movies of IRT subway lines taken in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s by various individuals. We begin with a look at the Broadway line. Here a train of high V's emerges from the tunnel north of 116th Street and comes into the 125th Street station on the Big Steel Arch Bridge over 125th Street, formerly called Manhattan Street at this point. The Broadway line was one of the last strongholds of the old-style IRT cars, the ones with the 600-volt controllers called the high vs or high-voltage control cars. Mixed in with these trains are standard body cars and some of the older Gibbs-bodied cars, the first steel subway cars, built in 1904 and 5, and modified in later years. Also included are some of the 50 uh, deck roof cars that were built in 1906. You'll see them from time to time. These views taken in the mid-1950s show the uh, newer trains replacing the old ones, but here we have a flashback to the 1940s with a train of high voltage cars still with the old kerosene markers coming into the tunnel north of 116th Street. There's one of the Gibbs cars at the south end of a train heading southbound at 125th Street. The modified Gibbs cars were of two types. Uh, the ones that had the modified doors were uh, fitted for multiple unit door control and could be used anywhere in the train. The ones that did not have modified doors had only hand-operated doors and could be used only at the end of a train so that the conductor at the front or the guard at the rear would operate the doors in the train with uh, multiple unit door control but the doors on the end cars by hand. The hand controls were long levers mounted on the ends of the cars. There's one of the deck roof cars. These cars were never modified for multiple unit door control, so they could only be used on one end or the other of a train. Here's a southbound train with a deck roof car at the south end, and the rest of the train, except for the north car, would be multiple unit door control cars. So at each station the train stopped at, the uh, conductor at the front between the first and the second car would uh, open the doors, on the deck roof car by moving the long lever and then using his little button controls to operate the doors in the rest of the train. The guard at the rear between the last car and the second from last would operate in a similar manner. If he had a uh, an unmodified car at the rear he would operate the controls in that car by hand and the control in the rest of the train by uh, the buttons. We're emerging from the tunnel under Fort George and coming into Dykeman Street Station. Still in the late 1940s, rush hour train of 10 cars. And looking north from Dykeman Street, we see a train coming from 207th Street Station via Nagel Avenue and down around the curve into the Dykeman Street Station at the north end of the tunnel. The platforms had already been extended to accommodate 10 car trains and you can see the tunnel portal there. There was also a substation next to Dykeman Street Station and the substation at one time had a siding of its own but the siding is where the platforms were extended on the southbound side. A northbound Broadway line train emerging from the tunnel and a southbound train, and another northbound train of high vs at the tunnel portal at Dykeman Street. Typical station sign at street level telling passengers what trains they could board there. 225th Street and Broadway was just over the Harlem River Ship Canal between Manhattan and the Bronx. Technically this part of the Bronx was in Manhattan since it was within the boundary lines of the original Spite and Dival Creek and Harlem River. But it's on the north side of the Ship Canal Bridge. The Ship Canal Bridge was the second one built there. The first one was moved down to uh, 207th Street and became the University Heights Bridge. This second bridge was added in 1907 when the IRT line was extended northward on an elevated structure along Broadway 
and the second bridge had the second level for the, uh, for the uh, IRT trains. Around 1960, this bridge was itself replaced by the present lift bridge, which also has two levels. As with most IRT lines, the middle track was used for off-hour layups of trains not used during the daytime or at night, but just for rush hours. Here's a train of the high-voltage cars with standard bodies. They could readily be distinguished from the side because the side doors had three panels below the windows instead of the large single panel which characterized the low-voltage control cars and some of the high-voltage trailers. There's a deck roof car on the south end of this northbound train. You will find deck roof cars and unmodified Gibbs cars only on the ends of the train since they had the manual door controls. Here's a northbound train coming over the Broadway Bridge as it was then. The Marble Hill Station of the New York Central Railroad is immediately below and the train was pulling into the uh, station at 225th Street. Now we go over to the Pelham Bay Line. This is looking northward from the Whitlock Avenue station area. You see the two truss bridges, one over the uh, New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad and the other over the Bronx River. That train of high voltage control cars is coming around the curve from the bridges and into the Whitlock Avenue station. It has made its stop at Whitlock Avenue station and is heading southward into the tunnel. The Pelham Bay line was another stronghold of the high voltage control cars. One reason for it was that they could be used uh, at the short stations on the original part of the subway in Manhattan. By the way, we're passing Westchester Yard here, looking northward into the yard from a train going southbound. This is at St. Lawrence Avenue station. This is after 1950, when the World's Fair cars, built in 1938, were taken off the flushing line, were replaced by the R12s, 14s, and 15s, and were put in service on the flushing line where they shared service with the high voltage cars. The World's Fair cars were Steinway cars built to operate with the other Steinway IRT cars. Here we have a train of almost uh, almost entirely Gibbs cars with just the two South cars, standard body cars. Those Gibbs cars were modified motors though with a multiple unit door control. We're passing more layups here heading northward on the Pelham Bay Line. We're approaching Castle Hill Avenue Station with another train laid up. This is the uh, curve north of Castle Hill Avenue Station with a southbound train coming around the curve and here we are heading into the Pelham Bay Park Terminal back in the days when the IRT old style cars dominated the service on the Pelham Bay Park Line. This rather poor view is heading southward into the tunnel north of 149th Street and 3rd Avenue with the connection for the 2nd Avenue L trains still there, although abandoned. That structure you saw overhead was the Bergen Avenue connection that allowed 2nd Avenue L trains to operate from Freeman Street into the 143rd Street station of the 3rd Avenue elevated in the Bronx. We look at some of the scenes underground with the old style IRT cars. Here for example is the two car Bowling Green shuttle as it was when operated with old style cars. It shuttled only between the short platform at Bowling Green and the uh, inside platform at South Ferry. Here's a mainline train heading southbound at 14th Street. After fluorescent lights had been installed it uh, became just barely possible to get black and white movie footage exposed in uh, a place like this. So we're able to see uh, old style IR tree trains coming around the curve at 14th Street unobstructed by the uh, columns 
since the columns were in the middle of the platform at, at, in most places there instead of close to the edge. Fourteenth Street still has gap fillers to uh, compensate for the wide space between the car side and the uh, edge of the platform around the sharp curves. On the east side IRT, the Jerome Avenue line was the last line to use low voltage old style body cars in regular service. So these trains that you see here are probably Jerome Avenue or Jerome Avenue Expresses heading southward at 14th Street. By this time headlights had been added to the ends of the old style IRT cars replacing the kerosene marker lamps you saw in the earlier views. These are views taken in the early 1960s when the old style trains were running out their last miles gradually being replaced by deliveries of newer IRT cars. Here's the Bowling Green shuttle again still with the old style cars typical IRT car of the post-World War II era, the old style bodies, and now we're riding a, an IRT uh, Lexington Avenue through Express emerging from 149th Street and 3rd Avenue and coming up onto the uh, elevated line on Westchester Avenue. The structure overhead which you saw in an earlier view had already been torn down although some of the girders remain even today, as you see on the left over there. That was the Bergen Avenue connection for the Freeman Street trains of the 2nd Avenue elevated line and later of the 3rd Avenue elevated line. Now we move over into the middle track as we see a southbound train of old-style body cars approaching, and we ride the middle track all the way up to East 180th Street, and in those days the through expresses stayed on the middle track till Gun Hill Road. Passing through the South Bronx here, we pass various stations of Jackson Avenue, Prospect Avenue, and so forth. There's a southbound train on the outside track. This is a view at East 180th Street of a southbound train of old style body cars leaving East 180th Street, going over west toward the 177th Street station, and the train was just about to pass the inspection barn which was on the elevated structure there north of 177th Street station and which was torn down sometime after 1949. So these views are mixed late 1940s and early 1950s as well as the early 60s. At Bronx Park East we see a northbound Lexington Avenue through Express heading up the middle track. Sometime around 1960 or 61 the expresses were rerouted into the local track and made all stops north of East 180th Street. But at that time, they uh, skipped all stops between 180th Street and Gun Hill Road, pulling into the middle track at Gun Hill Road and then crossing over to the outside track north of Gun Hill Road. Here again is a through express of old style body IRT cars heading northward, coming up to Pelham Parkway up the long grade from Bronx Park East and passing right through Pelham Parkway Station without stopping. Passing through uh, Allerton Avenue. And Burke Avenue.
The expresses, of course, operated southbound in the morning rush hour and northbound in the evening rush hour. And now at Gunhill Road, we have a northbound through express and a northbound regular express approaching Gunhill Road simultaneously in an evening rush hour. The train nearest to us is the through express, making its station stop in the middle track at Gunhill Road. Since the through express is switched over to the local track north of Gunhill Road, it was necessary for one train to wait for the other one to leave before the, uh, the one train could move. Here's another through express coming up into Gunhill Road, this time without being accompanied by a train on the outside track. By this time, the low-voltage trains were the only old-style body uh, cars left. The high-voltage cars had uh, all been removed from service in the very late 1950s. Some of them lasted in service on the Broadway line until 1959. But over here on the east side IRT lines, they uh, had been removed from service sometime earlier. Now we're near 219th Street Station, we see a northbound express, a through express, switching over from the middle track to the northbound outside track and making its station stop at 219th Street. From here up to the uh, terminal at 241st Street, uh, all trains would stop at all stations. Notice the air raid warning siren on the roof of the station there. This was common in the 1950s and 60s when there were still threats of atomic attack uh, on New York City, or perceived threats in any event. Most of the elevated stations had the air raid warning sirens mounted on their roofs. Here's another northbound through express coming off the middle track and into the outside northbound track just south of the 219th Street station. close-up view of the motor truck of one of the low-voltage motor cars. The white line under the number there indicates that the car could operate only with certain other cars of its type in uh, electric multiple unit service. Bedford Park Boulevard, 200th Street, was the station on the Jerome Avenue IRT line. And here we are looking north from that station way up toward Marshall Parkway with part of the IND concourse yard visible at the lower left. This was when IRT Jerome Avenue trains were still operated with old style body cars of the low voltage type, the low voltage controller type. Notice the semaphore signal still in use at that time. This is Fordham Road Station seen from the parking garage on the east side of Jerome Avenue. Looking north from Fordham Road in the distance is Kingsbridge Armory and the train is heading northward toward Kingsbridge Road Station. Here's a train of newer IRT cars, what are they, R-17s or something of that type, which were slowly replacing the last of the old-style 
IRT trains on the Jerome Avenue line. This train is operating on the middle track here, probably some sort of test service rather than revenue run. A southbound train of old style body cars heading into Fordham Road. Fordham Tower is visible on the left. That's gone now, but it used to control the switches north of Fordham Road that 6th and 9th Avenue elevated expresses would use during rush hours when they originated or terminated at Fordham Road. This is the curve of the Jerome Avenue line where it uh, leaves Jerome Avenue and curves onto River Avenue between 167th and 161st Street. The southbound train is curving off Jerome Avenue and heading onto River Avenue where it will stop at 161st Street next to Yankee Stadium and then proceed down into the tunnel. The view here is north looking up Jerome Avenue of a northbound old-style IRT train coming off River Avenue and heading on to Jerome Avenue, passing by the old Lincoln Hospital, I'm sorry, the old Morrisania Hospital. This is south of 161st Street as the train curves off River Avenue and heads down into the tunnel portal south of Yankee Stadium, which is the structure which is the structure in the background there before it was rebuilt. There's a northbound old style IRT train emerging from the tunnel and heading up into 161st Street. And a southbound train coming around the same same curve and entering the tunnel. Northbound train emerging from the tunnel and heading up around the curve into 161st Street Station. Southbound train of new style IRT cars coming around the curve and heading into the tunnel. As you can see, the new trains were gradually replacing the old ones and were interspersed with the old ones on the Jerome Avenue line here. Here are some views out along the New Lots line in Brooklyn, and now we go to Queensboro Plaza, where major changes were underway in 1949. This is an IRT subway train of Steinway cars, that is old style bodies, coming from Courthouse Square into Queensboro Plaza, and will head out to either Flushing or Astoria. Until June of 1949, IRT trains served both the Astoria and Flushing lines, and those two lines were also served by BMT shuttle trains of elevated cars, meeting the steel BMT subway trains at Queensboro Plaza. The footbridge that you see here was installed for temporary purposes so that IRT and BMT passengers could transfer. Now, this IRT train has just left Queensboro Plaza and is taking the cross, crossover to the Astoria line. This is before the changes were completed at Queensboro Plaza, in which all IRT trains would serve the Flushing line and all BMT subway trains would serve the Astoria line. The platforms on the Astoria line had to be cut back to allow the passage of BMT subway trains. Here's an IRT subway train from Astoria coming into Queensboro Plaza. The IRT used the south half of both levels at Queensboro Plaza. The BMT used the north half of both levels at Queensboro Plaza. So there was quite a complex of tracks and switches here, allowing trains from each line to use each half of the station. 
Here's another IRT train coming out of Queensboro Plaza and taking the crossover heading for Astoria. All this was rationalized in 1949 when just the IRT half of the station was kept for use by both IRT trains on the south side of both levels and BMT trains on the north side of both levels. With all BMT trains operating to and from Astoria and all IRT trains operating to and from Flushing. 52nd Street on the Flushing line with a rush hour express train of IRT Steinway series old style body cars. Woodside over the Long Island Railroad. Again with a train of old style IRT cars. Out at 111th Street at the east end of the station we see a train heading for the yard on the lower level going into the ramp and an express train heading for Willits Point Boulevard on the upper level. Our train is riding the outside local track crossing over the yard lead where we saw a train of BMT L cars there, the Q series type of cars and heading out toward Willits Point Boulevard, the station which had been greatly modified for the 1939 and 40 New York World's Fair. Heading now over the Flushing Creek Bridge, we see an IRT train on the left coming from Main Street, and there's a train of IRT World's Fair bodied cars, 50 of which were built for the uh, service to and from the New York World's Fair. This is at the Willits Point Boulevard station in 1940, and much later on in 1950, we see a new train of R15 types, which, along with the R12s and 14s, replaced the World's Fair cars and the older Steinway cars on uh, the uh, Flushing Line IRT service. There's a solid train of R15s, and it's passing a solid train of R12s and 14s. Here we have a train of the R12s and 14s, which were built around 1948 and 49. And this, and this is a train of R15s, the first arch roof cars, which came in 1950. The R12s, 14s, and 15s could all be intermixed in trains, but at first they were kept in solid trains of their own types. The R12s, 14s, and 15s remained on the Flushing line until about 1963 when they were replaced by the new R36s for service to the 1964 and 65 New York World's Fair. Then they were scattered all over the remainder of the IRT system. This is the Grand Central station of the IRT Flushing line with trains of R12s, 14s, and 15s in service before 1963. There's a train of R12s and 14s and another similar train at Grand Central. Still at Grand Central, still watching trains of R12s and 14s, which were kept in solid trains at that time. Queensboro Plaza again, after the modifications had been made so that only the south half of both levels was in use, with the south track on both levels for IRT trains and the north track on both levels for BMT trains. Across the platform transfers were therefore made possible and the north platforms on both levels were abandoned and were later torn down.
Here's a solid train of R15 IRT cars coming from Courthouse Square into Queensboro Plaza. And on the adjacent track, where 2nd Avenue L trains had once come in, we see BMT trains. And we panorama around for a look at the abandoned BMT half of the upper level. Here's another train of R15 IRT cars coming into the Queensboro Plaza station, upper level south half. Beyond the station, the crossovers were still in place, allowing the uh, IRT subway trains to uh, go to the Astoria line. But by this time, uh, the regular service uh, was rationalized so that all IRT trains use the flushing line, as that one is doing, heading eastward out of Queensboro Plaza. Woodside again with trains of the R12s, 14s, and 15s. This is the early 1950s now, after the new equipment had displaced the old Steinway cars, which were then scattered around the other IRT lines. A solid train of IRT R12s and 14s. And now it's 1979, and we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the opening of the IRT subway in 1904. Five old-style IRT museum cars were refurbished for the Diamond Jubilee train, which the remainder of this tape is devoted to. And the uh, Diamond Jubilee began with a special run from the Grand Central Shuttle Station down into the Lexington Avenue subway and a trip around the City Hall Loop and a ride uptown. The museum train was put in regular service on various IRT lines for Jubilee purposes. And here we see it at the Times Square shuttle at the westernmost platform, the old southbound platform of the shuttle. Here we are back at Grand Central and a quick view of the interior of these cars. along with a uh, poster in the car explaining the purpose of the Diamond Jubilee train and hoping that the public will gather some uh, historical knowledge from this. Two fellows dressed as old-time cops. I had a bit of nostalgic atmosphere to the train, and now the motorman takes the handles of the Diamond Jubilee train and proceeds down the uh, IRT Lexington Avenue line for a fan trip. We scatter ourselves around the IRT and we wind up at 96th Street. There's the train heading northbound and coming north out of the tunnel, out of the tunnel, north of 116th Street and into the 125th Street station on the Broadway line. The three cars with wooden window frames had the window frames painted orange, and the two cars with brass window frames had the window frames polished. The red paint was in simulation of the original IRT cars of 1904-1905, complete with striping and fancy lettering. Electric marker lamps were made up simulating the old-style kerosene marker lights, and we used both as markers on the rear and headlights on the front. Here the train lays over in the middle track at 125th Street and Broadway, while regular trains and service pass it by in both directions. These were photo stops made simply for the uh, benefit of the rail fan photographers on board the train. Now the southbound Diamond Jubilee train is heading back into the Broadway Line Tunnel north of 116th Street. A 
A special ceremony was held in front of City Hall in Manhattan to mark the 75th anniversary of the Diamond Jubilee train, October 27, 1904 to 1979. The Diamond Jubilee train along with the BMT train were displayed in the BMT Chamber Street station under the municipal building adjacent to City Hall and then the four car Diamond Jubilee train, one car was saved for display purposes, was run across the Williamsburg Bridge past the William Savings, Williamsburg Savings Bank dome as you see over here and as far as Marcy Avenue in Brooklyn where it was turned back for the run back to Manhattan. Admittedly this was not part of the IRT lines neither in 1904 nor at any other time but conditions having changed so much since 1904 it was no longer possible to duplicate the run of the original IRT subway so some substitutions had to be made and for the benefit of the photographers that day it was certainly uh, a lot nicer having the train outdoors. There it is at Marcy Avenue and heading out beyond Marcy Avenue to turn back to Manhattan. You see it moving into the middle track there to make the reverse move. Having made the reverse move, the train approaches Marcy Avenue on the Manhattan-bound side and will run across the Williamsburg Bridge and back into Chamber Street. One car of the train was left at Chamber Street Station for the display for the general public. Now the Diamond Jubilee train ran fan trips on many places. Here it is on the Pelham Bay Line crossing over the Bronx River on one of the steel truss bridges. It will cross the uh, New Haven Railroad tracks on the other truss bridge and curve around into Whitlock Avenue from which station this view was made. In the lower right hand corner may be seen the old Westchester Avenue station of the New Haven Railroad. The station had been abandoned in 1930 for New Haven service and 1937 for New York, Westchester, and Boston service. Here's the Diamond Jubilee train coming through Whitlock Avenue, southbound, ready to enter the tunnel of the Pelham Bay Line and head down through the South Bronx and into Manhattan. Most IRT lines were covered at one time or another during the Diamond Jubilee celebrations in 1979 and 1980. Here we are at Bronxdale Avenue awaiting the Diamond Jubilee train which is running behind a northbound regular train and now here comes the Diamond Jubilee train crossing Bronxdale Avenue on the Dyer Avenue line. This too was a fan trip. The train went up to Dyer Avenue, reversed ends, and here it is making a photo stop at Baychester Avenue Station. And coming south, approaching Gunhill Road on the Dyer Avenue line. Through the South Bronx, the train crosses over the various streets leading from the Westchester Avenue line down into the uh, station at 149th Street and 3rd Avenue. The train is, appears to be crossing over Brook, crossing over Brook Avenue at that point and is heading down into the tunnel leading into the 3rd Avenue station, the first station underground. Here we are emerging from the tunnel portal on the Jerome Avenue line and heading up around the curve past the now rebuilt Yankee Stadium near the 161st Street Station. Still on the Jerome Avenue line, we pass through the 167th Street and 170th Street area, as seen from the roof of a parking garage. The tracks 
used by the Polo Ground Shuttle and earlier by 6th and 9th Avenue elevated trains to connect to the Jerome Avenue line were still visible in the picture there since the structure was still in place. This northbound Diamond Jubilee train has left the Kingsbridge Road station and is passing by the uh, IND concourse yard and is heading north into uh, Bedford Park Boulevard station. Now the uh, Diamond Jubilee train is on the Broadway IRT line approaching the 242nd Street terminal. We're looking from inside the 240th Street yard down the yard lead tracks and we see the Diamond Jubilee train passing the, di the uh, yard lead tracks and heading up into the 242nd Street Van Cortland Park terminal. There was a period when the Diamond Jubilee train would operate regularly on this line on weekends and would be met by the Transit Authority's Transit Information Bus, which was a 1938 Fifth Avenue Coach Company Yellow Coach Double Decker, number 2124, which would meet the train at Van Cortland Park so that passengers could ride the train one way and the bus the other way if they so chose. There's the Transit Information Bus, former Fifth Avenue Coach Company 2124, right down below the Van Cortland Park terminal of the Broadway line. This was the Nostalgia Special in the 1979-1980 period as far as the IRT train was concerned. Ride an old-time train northbound and if you choose ride an old-time double-decker bus southbound. This went on for several weekends. Uh, at another weekend here is the Diamond Jubilee train approaching and stopping at the 242nd Street Terminal as seen from the south end looking north and here's the same train having uh, made its uh, station stop and changed ends now heading south out of 242nd Street Van Cortland Park Terminal for another run down the Broadway IRT subway. There was a period during the week when the Diamond Jubilee train was placed in regular Lexington Avenue local service between Brooklyn Bridge and 59th Street only. At 59th Street there is a tail track between the two local tracks on the upper level which allowed the train to be turned from northbound to southbound. The train was operated two minutes behind a regular train placing it as an extra in between two normal Lexington Avenue locals and it was open to the public. Many people got on board the train and marveled at the restored old-time IRT trains and expressed nostalgia at having ridden cars like this which weren't in such good condition though many years earlier. Other people simply got on the train figuring it was a normal train and paid not the slightest attention to the fact that it was a train of restored old-time cars. They simply used it to get from 59th Street to some other station or to points in between. Here it is at 14th Street on the southbound local track. Some people stood there bewildered wondering whether this was a regular train, but it was operated as a regular train between Brooklyn Bridge and 59th Street. Still at 14th Street, this time northbound. Leaving 14th Street as a northbound local, the Diamond Jubilee train proceeds around the curve and heads up north. It will not stop at 18th Street because that station was closed and abandoned around 1948. Its next stop will be, its next stop will be 23rd Street. Southbound at Grand Central, 
the five car train stops in the local at the local platform people rush to get on board and it continues north making all stops to 59th Street only then comes the fun of discharging all the passengers reversing at the tail track and pulling into 59th Street southbound empty and watching all the passengers get on board for a local run down to Brooklyn Bridge the train was stored when not in use at Westchester Yard and here it is pulling out of the express track at Parkchester on the Pelham Bay line heading north up the middle track and will be put into Westchester Yard for its overnight service Another use of the Diamond Jubilee train was on the Queen's Day celebrations held once a year uh, in the borough of Queens with uh, ceremonies and uh, attractions in the World's Fair grounds at Flushing Meadows Park. And the Diamond Jubilee train was operated as an express between Woodside and uh, Main Street, stopping, of course, at Willits Point for the uh, visitors to the... Uh, to the Queen's Day celebrations. Here it is arriving at Willits Point on a westbound trip. The train shuttled only between Main Street and Woodside in order not to have to foul the regular trains on the two-track portion of the line near Queensboro Plaza. At Woodside, it could simply reverse ends in the middle track without interfering with regular service. There's a regular train of R36s uh, as we take the upper level heading toward 111th Street. And at 111th Street from one of the platforms, we look up and see the Diamond Jubilee train in Queen's Day celebration service passing by on the express track. For this shuttle service, one red tail light and one white uh, headlight were left in place on each end of the train. These were the ones I mentioned before were made up to look like the old time kerosene lamps and were simply uh, switched from uh, tail light to headlight as the train reversed ends. This train has changed ends at Woodside and is heading back toward Willits Point and Main Street. As it does so, it passes a regular flushing train heading eastbound. Another view on a Queen's Day celebration, the train has left Woodside and is heading eastward toward Willits Point and Main Street. A regular passenger stop was made at Junction Boulevard, which is a regular express stop anyway. And then the train would pull out and head for Willits Point Boulevard, the next stop. Here it is again eastbound at 111th Street, taking the upper level flyover above the local tracks and the yard lead tracks. After the Diamond Jubilee was over, the train was stored in Concourse Yard, pending the operation of other fan trips and celebrations, which unfortunately never came. Graffiti vandals rather soon attacked the train as it stood on a track at the south end of Concourse Yard, and as may be seen here, deterioration set in as more and more vandalism occurred. The train never operated as a Diamond Jubilee train again or as anything else under its own power. The cars were so badly vandal vandalized that they were not considered 
up to restoration and they were either scrapped or sold with one or two cars going to the Brantford Trolley Museum, thus ending our look at the IRT line and the Diamond Jubilee train.